presenter is is uh, Bob Roush from Transcore, I believe. And uh, when when our presenters are done, we'll do some Q and A um, and talk about um, all of the issues that are brought today. So, Bob, if you want to take it away now. Uh, thanks, Blaine. Uh, let me see. I think I can now make this thing go. Uh, nope, it just moved off a little bit. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in New York because uh, we are working with fleets. Uh, it's not just put out the RSUs and SPAT challenge. Hope they will listen. We actually have to go on the whole side of the fleet. And I'll talk a little bit about our project and try to give you some over, over insights and lessons learned from our uh, rather interesting fleet deployment to date. Um, let's see if I can keep this thing going. Uh, the, our goal has been thousands of vehicles, and we are, right now we're up to a uh, little over 800 as of yesterday, as a matter of fact. Uh, we are actually trying to outfit a wide variety of vehicles. In our case, it was a procurement of a custom OBUs, onboard units. Uh, we refer to them as ASDs. And we're, we, we are planning to have about 500 RSUs. We're up to about 300 so far. Uh, and I won't talk about those, but we're uh, upgrading our controllers. We're using the 1202V3 SPAT, and we're streaming SPAT map uh, to a, also to an Amazon web server so we can do uh, pedestrian apps. The, the important thing to remember about the, the project in New York is that it was a, uh, it, it, the goal of the project was actually to see how well things, were, uh, my, uh, my thing is very sensitive here, uh, how, see how well things things reacted to, uh, uh, where am I going to make that, to, to really test what it would do or how the connected vehicle technology worked in the urban environment. These are our applications on the top of the, the ones in blue are the usual applications you've seen, but there's a number of other applications that are more V2I focused that we're actually trying to do. So the selection of what we're doing with the vehicles right now is focused on those V2I applications, but more importantly on the bottom, we had to introduce a number of applications that were related to how you operate and maintain both the fleets, uh, the fleet of vehicles, track what they're doing, as well as the system aspects. Uh, the, the, the project area, as it were, is right in the heart of Manhattan, and we're also got a piece in Brooklyn, so we're experiencing a whole lot of issues. The uh, purple lines are brag brought in uh, th things we had to install afterwards to improve our location accuracy. There are additional RSUs that we do that we support for the triangulation. So that's sort of an overview of the project. Uh, we're, again, we're moving forward now with our uh, fleet deployment. But I'm going to talk about three things today. Practical data collection, what we've been going through with the onboard units, and some of the security aspects. And now, because we specified or we're specifying the units, we went through a complete development of what we wanted to do in the back office or with the data collection. We had to make sure it was both scalable, that it would address any of the constraints of our backhaul, uh, that we were more interested in, in retrieving information than raw data to leverage, and we can leveraging our edge computing devices, our OBUs and RSUs. But one prerequisite for our project was that it lived in the DSRC environment. Uh, if you look at what's been going on in the in the, the demonstration projects and, and safety pilots and others, they've been collecting every BSM, every SPAT, every map, every TIM message heard by everybody from everybody. And that winds up generating literally gigabytes of, you know, per hour, terabytes per day, and it's just not practical with a wireless backhaul. So we went back to reanalyzing our data needs and address how we would collect this data, because the, the data collection is what a lot of this is about. Let's see if I can get this to advance here. Uh, our data collection was dri was needs driven. Uh, it was. Uh, it, I'm sorry, I'm having problems with my computer today. It was needs driven. They basically, we, the, the, one of the prerequisites of these of the pilot projects was to actually be able to measure or quantify the benefits and the issues, as it were. So we developed a whole series of actually 47 performance metrics. And using the performance metrics, we then developed our 
data collection, uh, go this way, data collection program, uh, which it really, rather than just collect all the BSMs, we in fact were doing the, uh, we, we set down to collect event data logs, uh, and we re these are all in our device procurement, you'll see a little more detail, to collect all of the relevant data for each individual event, that's an alert, a warning, and, and before and afterwards. Then we provided some custom, uh, customized event data collection for it. We have the ability to store it, encrypt it, it has a limited lifespan on the vehicle. And then we collect all of this data over the air from the OBU to the RSU and using the DSRC communications. So that's our only means of, of collecting the data. The data itself is obfuscated uh, and, 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 and uh, obfuscated and uh, aggregated so it is no longer uh, decipherable into PII. Uh, we also are collecting RF logs for operations and management support, and that is the OBUs collect the first and last BSM, uh, first that they hear from others, uh, the first and last SPAT and MAP message they hear from every RSU, and the RSU in turn collects the first and last BSM it hears along the way. Just kind of. The, uh, w w from this, we pushed on the edge computing to, the, uh, to collect uh, travel times at the ro remote, uh, the remote communications unit. Uh, and it, uh, at the RSUs, and what it does is it looks at and determines when one of these devices crosses into an intersection, relays that to a TMC so we can compute it. So the, the alternative here is it gets us a whole lot more data without sacrificing the volume of, of raw data it would take. We actually are collecting about two, two BSMs per vehicle while it's in range rather than the 600 per minute we would collect to actually do this comp type of computation. In the, uh, the events, the event records, we collect uh, the, a short period of time before and a short period of time after. Basically, it's about 10 seconds before and 10 seconds after, depending upon the type of event we're trying to track, or up to 180 seconds before and after uh, for things that may want to deal with what happened for the intersection cycle. Uh, when we looked at all of this, this provides a practical mechanism for data collection. The, this gives you another picture of what it is that we're collecting. The, the actual onboard vehicle unit collects the, the, the BSMs it hears from the couple of nearby units, so those that are within a region of interest, and then in its own BSM, as well as the, any spats and maps, it hears from the closest intersections. And then, in turn, it also captures all of the parameters that triggered the alert. So from this, we can analyze the alert we got, what happened, and why it happened. Is this going to advance? Yes, it is. In our procurement documents, we included uh, concepts of the data we wanted to collect. And if you look at what's going on on the onboard unit, this is sort of a, a rough flow chart for the collection of the pieces of data. So we're keeping a five-minute rotary buffer, which gets us the before and after, actually up to 300 seconds. We collect all the RF data, and then the other d devices we, we see, and the breadcrumbs, one of the other things we collect is from the uh, system status log. We'll collect start time, end time of trips. We also collect uptime GPS log and any issues we have with the software. The data collection is uploaded, and here the uploading is done so it's secure, and the, the various colored dots, this is a, a concept that was put in the specs, and the vendors have built it. Our log files are created as a, a, a record at a time, or as it were, and then each record uh, winds up being compressed because we have a limited bandwidth in our backhaul. It is then signed so we can be, guarantee the integrity, and then we are guarantee its delivery. We don't want to lose any data. So what you're seeing on here is the concept that was put into our procurement document that ensured that the OBU and then the OBU-RSU combination collected what we needed and that it got through to the end, uh, to the TMC, 
uh, intact, that is, and that we didn't lose any data. This time. The, the, we had to protect the data from its privacy, and after it is uploaded, as I said, the data is normalized, obfuscated, and aggregated such that you cannot disaggregate it. It's not stored in its raw forms. BSMs could be used, and we didn't want that, so we make sure that the BSMs that we are saving cannot be used to recreate accident scenes. If you think about it, if you collect every, every BSM at an intersection, merge that with the police records, you can tell exactly what the accident was, who was at fault, and why, and that was not data we wanted to make sure we had. The data is only associated with the vehicle. We don't have any idea of who's driving the vehicle. And the, the system tracks the units just to make sure that the software updates are right and that the general usage and make sure that we don't have any that, that wander off. Uh, can you advance the slides for me here? I'm having some problems with the advancing. This time it did, but it's not always. To give you an idea of what we can do with the data, what we are doing with the data, the data that we've been getting so far from the RSUs is the first and last. Now, this is where around our, our office in Queens. Actually, it's around the city's office in Queens where the RSU is. We are actually getting data from up to 1,100 feet away, 1,100 meters away, um, 500 meters across to the bridge. What, what we're seeing is a, the range is much bigger than the 300 meters we would have expected. But you can also see that we're, where it is, you can see that we collect vehicles up and down the avenues. Uh, if I go, I, I've got a couple other slides here if they advance. We are now using this data that we collect from the RSUs anyway, from the OBUs, to determine what services we're going to provide where. Now I'm going to go a little bit on the services because we have to deal with the over-the-air downloads and uploads. So we, we, by using the data we're collecting, we've been able to actually uh, determine where we want to park it. Here's an example in Manhattan. The little uh, 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 triangles, as it were, are all where we've got RSUs. The ones here were not operational. They, they, the city has been installing a new communications network, and we're just getting those online now. Uh, I'm going to look at some of the onboard unit and configuration considerations now that we've gone through. Uh, that's data collection. Now, in the onboard unit, if the, you'll have to advance the slide, I guess. Can you do that? All right. Uh, our procurement was done through a, a, a was the OBU was an open specification. Now, we addressed all the applications from the, our con ops. We addressed the logging requirements from our con ops. And then we used portions of the safety pilot in vehicle device specifications, uh, worked with our stakeholders to make sure that we had all the performance measures were being collected on the vehicle, worked with the fleet owners to address any of the, their concerns and data they wanted, and then their requirements, one of their requirements we had for our OBU was that we not have any display. The specifications that we put out for our procurement of the in-vehicle devices included a complete installation kit with antennas, uh, data cables, uh, all the cables that are detected to the CAN bus, mounting mechanisms, and so forth. And we identified in our procurement the security requirements. Some of the things to consider when you're buying an onboard unit were the power down considerations. Everybody says, no, you can't draw any power when the, when the ignition's not on. Well, that doesn't quite work right. So we wound up specifying the minimum power requirements, uh, quiescent power requirements, which are within SAE standards. We are very concerned about watchdogs, and we don't want to have to touch the vehicles. So I'll go a little bit more on that a little bit later slide, but this was an experimental purchase process, which can be very difficult to manage. But we're buying thousands of units, and we had to go through the normal process. We identified the over-the-air uh, requirements. If you go to the next slide, our over-the-air considerations that we took on looked at uh, multiple mechanisms for the, how we would collect the data and deal with downloads. Uh, DSRC was sort of a requirement for all the pilot projects to use. So we only have two mechanisms that we can use for collecting over the air, either the data 
or updating the software, and that's DSRC. We can also do that when we connect directly to the vehicle, but because these are fleet vehicles and they're in service, we can't do that. There's a cost every time they bring the vehicles into the shop, and that gets prohibitive. So we establish the OTA requirements, and they support software downloads, and we are currently updating the firmware depending upon what additional features we have, whether they're silent or not. We collect all the data that's being collected on board. We get it uploaded over DSRC, and the DSRC service channels are what's used to, for the SCMS to download our certificates. Um, we develop a network coding scheme, and it, the way it works is the OBUs actually can accumulate their, their downloaded image over multiple RSUs until they've got it, validate it, and then store it. Next slide, please. Uh, we establish security profiles for the messages, the mandatory data elements, and the PSIDs. We have special service permissions, special security uh, service permissions that we've done because we have regulatory speed in, in our map message. Uh, we establish the priority with the vendor when it sees a, the wave service announcement, what goes first. In this case, OTA download is always first. So if the, when the RSU comes by, when the OBU comes by, it downloads first. We had to make considerable adjustments in the uh, urban environment. So you'll hear that in the CAN bus interface. We meet to meet J2945-1 requirements, which is what was the base requirements for all the applications. Uh, then the, once they get done with the installation, they have to go through a, uh, look, uh, a, a calibration for the navigation unit, and then we verify the, the installation, the GPS integrity. Uh, there are some other issues within vehicle mounting, CAN bus interface, and over the air. We did a lot of work with over the air stability and reliability and transfer time to make sure that whatever we did over the air updates with our devices, we, no matter what we did, we didn't brick the devices. Next slide. Uh, the OBUs have extensive configuration requirements for each vehicle, make and model. We actually have to configure so it knows where the antenna is, uh, where the other, uh, where all of the, 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 all the different vehicle types, all the parameters that, that make sure that tell the, our, the onboard unit how it's to work. Uh, this is just gives you some flavor for the nature of the class of, of the uh, configuration we have to do. Uh, next slide. All right. And then this is just more of the same. This is, again, we have an interface to the unit. Uh, when you're mounting the antenna, where it mounts at, it matters, try your antenna mounts and see what you get for radiation. We're using it through the glass antenna in one case. In the other case, this is classic shark fin. Next slide. Uh, mounting it in the vehicle, we bolted it under the seat. It's securely mounted because if you don't securely mount it, uh, the net inertial navigation system won't work. By the way, you have to make a decision there whether you're going to use inertial navigation or whether you're going to use the RTCM uh, correction. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the additional considerations, we had to target our individual groups so we can download particular vehicle groups. Uh, be careful if you wind up drilling. We did some significant vehicle damage because uh, the installation crews weren't using the right hardware and drilling. Uh, and the interface into the vehicle CAN bus I'll talk about can be tricky. Next slide, please. Uh, we wound up using a passive CAN bus interface because there are other devices in the vehicle. And when we go on the CAN bus to ask for the devices, it, that it would interfere. And the, using the OBD2 port, which is the easy plug-in port, the speed that we're getting, the, the speed accuracy and the rate at which we're getting it was not adequate. So when we, we adopted the use of this uh, passive interface so that all of our onboard units actually connect to the vehicle bus. Next slide, please. Uh, our user interface is all visual. We're using tones, beeps, words, text-to-voice and stereo speakers, I wish we could have connected to the vehicle audio system, but if we're not an OEM and if the OEMs don't give you all the rules to do it, that's not something you can do. Next slide, please. Bob, I'm gonna, I know security is important, but I'm gonna see if you can do it in about five minutes for the next oh, couple of uh, slides. I, I expect to skip through this quickly. Okay. Uh, one of the other, go ahead. 
the, one of the other considerations that you really need to understand is that when you get involved in the security systems, uh, this is, is sort of a, a lifespan, as it were, or the life of the, the security, what it takes to interface to the security system. It starts with your OBU developer. He's got to get his OBU certified. The vendor then enrolls the device in a secure environment by, uh, from the SCMS security enrollment portion. And then once the device is activated, it goes and gets its pseudonym certificates or operating certificates. And then the device becomes operational. And now, because we are topping off, as you'll see, uh, we have to actually, our, all of our certificates are renewed once a week, uh, and they start two days prior. So all of our units actually go through the RSU to go back and get more certificates. Go ahead, and you can advance the next slide. I wish my advancer was working, because I could go through quickly. Uh, some things to be, a care, be aware of, not all of the mechanisms and things necessary for the security system to be fully operational are currently in place. And if this will go to the next slide. Uh, this gives you a, just a rough idea of the, the network construct, the security walls or the security that we, we actually had to put into place. If you go to the next slide, you'll see this, this gives you an idea of the different protocols and how the security was managed within the system. Now the security between the, the RSU and the uh, onboard unit, of, of course, uses the 1609.2, the standard SCMS certificates, but it takes all of the rest of this to be able to actually support the security system. So when you're looking at what it's going to take to put security in place, these are the bits and pieces. This is how we did it in New York, but you will need all of these pieces. The ASCC is New York's traffic controller. Next slide. Uh, our certificates only last, I said, two weeks. They have to top off every week. Uh, and they have both geographic limits as well as the time limits. Uh, that has been a real challenge. The next slide, please. Uh, some of the lingering issues just you should be aware of as you look to procuring the onboard units. Uh, the pilots are using the SCMS from uh, ISS. It was, that was all arranged by uh, USDOT. Uh, initial behavior detection is under test, but it's not been deployed. The, the certificate revocation list distribution is just becoming available, but it's not integrated to the security software. The security software still has standards evolving, and not everything is well documented. Some of the standards, are, uh, some of the base standards are still undergoing changes as we are, as new people and other people are coming on uh, with the deployment. In our case, the three pilot projects work together to make sure we use the consistent interpretation. Uh, there is no current standard for the RSU. Ours was developed based upon what we had in place, and as I indicated earlier. Uh, and, and it also depended upon the, uh, uh, the NTCIP standards, and it depends. Our the whole design was based upon the DSRC uh, channel availability. Uh, next slide. I think that brings it to an end. Uh, and there's, uh, there's been a lot of material, more than I can cover in detail. If you go to the next slide, one more slide. This is the, uh, the resources that USDOT makes available about the pilot sites, and I can tell you that there's a wealth of information on the pilot sites from uh, our CONOPS documents all the way to some of the procurement documents and the design documents and all of the uh, evaluations they're doing. I hope that gives you a rough overview of uh, what we've been going through as we deploy and up, up, it's supposed to be supposed to be up as many as 8,000 onboard units. Back to you.